Hello again, and welcome back to uh, your friendly heavy physics teacher's physics lesson. Uh, this is for my college physics class. This is going to be for Unit 10, Lesson 2. Uh, we are going to apply our understanding of simple harmonic motion to the specific examples of springs and pendulums. Okay, uh, I'm going to need a moment here to set up a couple of demonstrations for you. Okay, so. Uh, here we are, springs, pendulum, and how they relate to simple harmonic motion. All right, here we go. You recall earlier this year, we used a spring similar to this one. And this one, you may have actually used one or the other of these two springs uh, to do the Hooke's Law Lab, wherein we investigated how um, the elasticity of the spring uh, was directly dependent on the force stretching the spring and how far the spring stretched, okay? So, if you recall, F equals K times X, that's how we determine the spring constant of these particular springs. Well, interestingly enough, it's that spring constant that is what's governing the type or the, uh, shall I say, characteristics of the simple harmonic motion that this can experience. Now, we're going to have one example. I'm going to talk about an example in a little bit. You're going to see it on uh, uh, one of my whiteboard presentations. Um, moving it from side to side on a frictionless surface. But since I can't recreate a frictionless surface with the similar effects that we're going to have here, I'm going to do this and we're going to oppose the elastic force of the spring with gravity, okay? And so first I'm going to establish the equilibrium position, all right? So I'm gonna put a 50 gram mass on the end of the spring and let it come down. And this right here represents the equilibrium position, okay? Now, if I displace it above that, gravity is gonna to attempt to pull it back down through the equilibrium position. And da -da -da -da, there we go. We have simple harmonic motion. Okay? So, what we should be able to do is make some measurements of that and figure out how the spring constant is interacting with the weight, interacting with the mass, in order to create that motion. Okay? So, I'm going to get a stopwatch. And I'm going to. Um, Make a measurement of the time it takes to make five vibrations. And we're going to use that data for some future calculations. So here we go. All right. I'm going to start this up. Set. Set it in motion. And set. Start. Wait. Set. Start. One, two, three, four. Stop. Okay, I get 3.99 seconds. Let's do that again to verify. Set, start, one, two, three, four, five. Four point one. So we're looking at a uh, uh, time for five vibrations, a time for five vibrations of four seconds. Let's call it four seconds here, okay? So we're going to use that for our, um, a future calculation. Okay, so using our, our knowledge of simple harmonic motion, if we have four seconds to make five vibrations, that means that there is 0.8 seconds per vibration. So its period is 0.8 seconds. In other words, is not quite taking a full second to go up and down once. Flip that, take the reciprocal of it, and we get 1.25 vibrations per second. So in other words, it's a little over a second to go up and down. Uh, you get a little more than one vibration for each second of motion that's happening. Okay? All right. Second trial. I'm going to in I'm going to double the mass on this. 
we go from 50 grams to 100 grams. Notice the new equilibrium position. Okay, so let's start this up. Oops. I'm going to start it by going down with it. There we are. Set, start. One, two, three, four, stop. I get 5.7 seconds. Okay, let's try it again. Set. Start, oops. set, start. One, two, three, four, stop. 5.6 seconds. All right, so we're looking at, you know, if we really wanted to, to get, we take multiple, multiple, might be about 5.65. So that's the number I'm going to use. I said 5.7, 5.6, take the average of those two, get 5.65. Okay. So let me do some calculations. Okay, uh, just checking my video here. All right, so according to my calculations, uh, that was 1.12 seconds per vibration. All right, and it's that means it's 0.893 hertz or 0.893 vibrations per second. Notice that it's slowed down from the last one. We had 1.25 vibrations per second. 1.25 hertz was the frequency. All right. The time period was a lot faster for the last one. Okay. Now I'm going to double the mass again. So it's going to be four times the original mass. Notice that to do this, I'm going to have to hang this over the end of whatever my, my uh, thing is. <laughs> it's out of view. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to move it back a little. Okay. There's my new equilibrium position. All right. So I'm going to restart it in motion, and we'll see what happens to our time and frequency. Okay, set, start, one, two, three, four, shoot. Okay, here we go, one more time. Set it in motion. Start. One, two, three, four, stop. I got 7.9 seconds. Okay, so let me uh, uh, do that again, get an average. One, two, three, four, stop. 7.9 seconds, okay? So, if we call it 7.9 seconds, then let's do some calculations. Okay, according to my calculations, I get uh, at 7.9 seconds per five vibrations, that means it's 1.6 seconds per vibration. So that's our period, okay? And then that also means that it's 0.3 or 0.63 hertz. Ha ha! At 50 grams, the time was 0.8 seconds. At 200 grams, four times the mass, the time is 1.6 seconds for the period. Hmm. I wonder, is 1.12 seconds 
the square root of 2 times larger than 0.8. Do a calculation on your own, and I bet you'll see that it is. So what this is suggesting is the relationship between the mass that's impeding the motion of the spring, the spring constant, and the period of motion. Well, we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay, so the simple harmonic motion of a spring, this time, instead of it going up and down, we're going to have it just go side to side, and it's just under the influence of the elastic properties of the spring. So the black part of this drawing represent this mass attached to the end of the spring at equilibrium. All right, the spring is is uh, kind of sitting there doing nothing. The mass is doing nothing. If I push it in to this blue location, that means that I've changed this position from the equilibrium position to a certain distance in from that. That's the x, that certain displacement from equilibrium. Well, that's going to be our maximum amplitude to the left of our starting point. Okay. And so that's why we've got negative A there. It's a number. It's some number. It's some distance in meters or centimeters or something like that. Okay? I let go, and the spring pushes it out. It moves it through the equilibrium position. Out over to here, though, because once it moves through the equilibrium position, the spring's no longer pushing it this way. The spring actually starts pulling it backwards. Well, that's going to slow it down and stop it. And then the spring's going to pull it back to the equilibrium position. But because there's no friction, it won't stop. And it comes back to here. Then it goes back. And then it goes back. And so you see the simple harmonic motion, all because the spring is pushing it when it's to the left of the equilibrium and pulling it when it's to the right of equilibrium. Okay? So for a spring, for a spring, the geometry of this, the, the, uh, the um, motion analysis that we can use to determine this, the period of a spring, T, equals 2 pi radical M over K, which there you see, okay? There's our square root relationship. So if I increase the mass, that's attached to the spring, that's going to make the time be longer. Notice that if you take the inverse of that, frequency, okay, notice that mass is now in the denominator. If I increase the mass here, I'm going to get a smaller number. So the frequency decreases when you increase the mass. Well, think about that physically. If you've got more mass that you need to move, it becomes harder to move because there's more inertia, okay? So the other factor here is spring constant. If we use a stiffer spring, that means that the period is going to get shorter. Higher spring constant is a stiffer spring. Stiffer spring means it's going to vibrate faster. So let's see if that happens. Okay, this was the spring I used a moment ago to start my demonstrations today. This is the spring that I have a different spring. You haven't used this one in class, um, but this is one I had available. Notice that when I put 50 grams of mass on this one, that's how far it stretches out. Pretty big distance. Low spring constant. Not a very stiff spring. Very loose spring. Okay? Put it on this one, notice that it barely stretches out, all right? You get a little bit of a stretch, okay? And if I displace it, look at that bounce, okay? All right, so here we go. Stiffer spring, notice with 50 grams of mass on it, it's already bouncing quicker. I'm going to put 100 grams of mass on it to get an, a slightly more easily measurable bounce out of it. The bounce should slow, right? I've added mass, doubled it, 
So it should be square root of two times quicker or slower than we just did. And notice that it indeed is slower, okay? So here I go, all right? Uh, 100 grams of mass. Ready, set, start. One, two, three, five. Oops. Okay. Hey, let me do it. One. Ready, set, start. One, two, three, four. Stop. I get 2.39 seconds. Okay. 2.39. How much mass would I have to add to this to get that to be double that, to be 4.6. I've got 100 grams of mass on it now. Should be 400 grams of mass to get about 4. Point, I'll call it four, between 4.6 and 4.8 seconds. Okay, so here we go. Here's 400 grams of mass. Okay. One, two, three, four, stop. <laughs> all right. Four point four point seven. All right. So there we go. There is our square root relationship. When you increase the mass, the time period is going to increase by the square root of the increase in the mass. The frequency is going to change based upon the stiffness of the spring. You have to physically change the spring in order to get um, the, the spring constant to cause a change. So there we have a constant value in our equation. The thing that is going to most affect the simple harmonic motion of the spring is how much mass you have on it. Okay? Alrighty, if you'll recall those simple harmonic motion uh, equations that we had the other day, okay? Linear distance is A cosine 2 pi over period times T. The, the linear velocity of it is the maximum velocity times the cyclic factor of the motion, all right? Sine is 2 pi over the period times the, the time within the period. The acceleration uh, that the uh, object is experiencing is negative the maximum acceleration times this uh, motion factor, okay? Now, for a spring, since the period is 2 pi radical m over k, if I substitute that into my equation here, x equals a cosine theta, uh, or cosine uh, 2 pi over, 2 pi times radical m over k, it becomes x equals a cosine radical k over m times t, all right? So where the spring is located in its vibration, where the mass on the end of the spring is located within its vibration, all right? Depends on how big the vibration can be, amplitude, times the cosine of the factors affecting how quickly it goes back and forth times the time at that particular moment within the period, okay? And then we can do that same substitution down here for the velocity. If I want to know the velocity at any moment in time during the vibration, here we go, all right? And if I want to know the acceleration that the spring is uh, exerting on the mass at any moment in time, it's this equation here, okay? That um, is how we can apply the simple harmonic motion equations, the basic simple harmonic motion equations, to the spring, all right? Make our substitution, and that's how we can determine the location of the mass at any time, its speed at any time during the motion, and the acceleration is experiencing at any time during the motion. All right?
Now, let's move to pendulums. At its essence, a pendulum is a very, very simple thing. We have complicated them by using them in clocks and so on, but a pendulum is no more than a weight, a mass, suspended on something that would allow it to swing. The simplest thing you can use is a string, okay? And so a pendulum normally has this equilibrium position where if you don't have any outside forces acting, you just let it sit, that's where it's gonna sit forever. Equilibrium, all right? The tension of the string is balancing the weight of the, the mass down here. We call that a pendulum bob, all right? That's the name for it, pendulum bob. If we bring it out though, notice that it rises slightly from its original position. We let it go, and there's our classic pendulum, all right? So, is gravity normally going to change while that's going on? And the answer is no, all right? So, like a spring, the spring itself won't change as long as you're using it, all right? So, here, gravity's not going to change. What can change to make this motion change? The most obvious thing will be change the length of the string. Okay? So if I make this shorter, it's shorter now. Notice that it swings back and forth quicker. Okay? And in the same way that a spring has that interesting uh, relationship with mass, all right, this has an interesting relationship with the geometry of this, that the length of it is what's affecting how long it takes to swing back and forth. That's because that length is affecting how much the component of the weight vector is interacting with the component of the tension vector, and I'm not gonna get into the math of it, okay? Suffice to say that at its essence, the period that it takes for the pendulum to go back and forth once depends on how long it is and the local acceleration due to gravity. If I were doing this on the moon, this would be moving uh, square root of one sixth slower, all right? Because the gravity on the moon is that much slower, all right? If I were doing this on a high gravity planet, Say, if I could stand on Jupiter, this would be going back and forth much more quickly. Its period would shorten because of that. Not necessarily its amplitude. Remember, the amplitude is how far from equilibrium it's vibrating. Okay? Okay, so a pendulum, it's this, this interaction between the force of gravity and the tension on the string. When you do the geometry of those forces, when you pull it out at small angles, and that's the key, it has to be really small angles, less than 10 degrees. When you, when you have it vibrating less than 10 degrees, then the relationship between the two forces, the tension on the string and the component of the weight that's accelerating it along the path, as you do that, the period of a pendulum can be determined by 2 pi radical L over G, where L is the length of the pendulum to the center of the bob, okay, and G is local acceleration due to gravity. Here on Earth, G is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared, okay? Now, um, uh, they love to throw these problems onto elevators and say, oh, what would be the period of the, of the pendulum if you were accelerating upward at three meters per second squared? Well, then that means the actual acceleration you'd use in this equation is the acceleration due to gravity plus the three meters per second squared. If it were falling, would it vibrate? If it were freely falling inside an elevator, would it vibrate? Five points. Send your answer in an email to me. Five points. If a pendulum 
were in an elevator that were freely falling, would it vibrate? Send me your answer in an email. It's worth five extra credit points whenever we get back to school. Okay? All right. The uh, motion equations for a pendulum. Um, here's our linear motion equation. In other words, how far separated from that vertical line, how far distance to one side or the other is it? Okay. For a pendulum, x equals a cosine radical g over l times t. The speed of the bob during the motion, okay, is radical g over l times uh, the amplitude sine of radical g over l times t. And the acceleration of the bob is that right there, okay? So these are the equations for uh, how we would figure out the simple harmonic motion, motion characteristics, motion possibilities during the motion of the pendulum at some point, at some time during that motion. Okay? Finally, um, some of the periodic properties of the motion whether it's a spring, whether it's a pendulum, whether it's any other sort of object moving with simple harmonic motion, okay? Your maximum amplitude. Your maximum amplitude occurs at the beginning, t equals zero. It occurs at half the period. I should actually use lowercase t's here on this side of the uh, equal side. Sorry for that, okay? so. The, the time when it's at its maximum amplitude would be at the start, t equals zero. Halfway through, the other side, you know, the far side, and then at the end of the first cycle, that's when you're at maximum amplitude. Your maximum velocity occurs at, that should, again, lowercase t, occurs at the first quarter of the period. All right, another way to say that is pi over 2. All right, and then it occurs at three quarters of the period on the way back toward the equilibrium position. All right, or I should say, when it's first passing through the equilibrium at one quarter of the period, and then when it's passing back through the equilibrium at three quarters of the period. Okay, and then of course, maximum acceleration occurs at the same times as maximum amplitude. The energy for a vibrational system. If it's a spring, it's simply the potential energy of the spring. If it's a pendulum, it depends on the gravitational potential energy of the pendulum, but the geometry of that orientation of the bob away and the force and the tension and all that geometry allows us to use this as an approximation for the energy okay so again energy of a vibrating spring system eh, its total energy is based upon its potential energy when it starts the energy of a pendulum eh, it's based on the potential energy this is a potential energy factor of when it starts, all right? Okay, and there you have it. Um, simple harmonic motion applied to springs and pendulums. Both of them have a square root relationship between the period of their swing and the factor that is affecting their uh, the simple harmonic motion. For a spring, it's the mass that's attached to it. For a pendulum, it's the length of the pendulum. All righty. Uh, be checking your email for um, the worksheets that are associated with this uh, particular lesson. And we'll be talking with that, talking about them and about this at our next meeting session. Have a good one. It's uh, good to see you all.